So Jason, you've been in the role now for two and a half years. Uh, you've had the opportunity to go coast to coast, city to city, uh, club to club and academy to academy. And you see, you've seen what's going on in our communities. What are some of the common challenges that you've seen in respect to developing our players? We have a lot of challenges in this country. And I think everyone in here knows that because you're living it day to day. Right? You're, the, you're at, the, at, the, at the coal face of the game, so to speak. And, and you're seeing what those challenges are. Um, geography is a massive challenge for us. Uh, and, and obviously you'll hear from the other gentlemen about their roles and, and, and how that affects them and impacts the professional game. Um, but the, the distances between our cities, the distances that players have to travel, uh, that's a big challenge for us. But I think the biggest challenge that we have to overcome is our own mindset. Um, there's way too much fighting that goes on in our sport. Uh, I find it hugely ironic that uh, we're asking kids, young players, to play as teammates and work together on, on a field of play to try and put a ball in the back of the net, but none of the adults want to work together. Uh, and that's a big, big obstacle. It's far bigger than any other logistical issue that we have to deal with. And until we put our weapons down and stop behaving like the Hatfields and the McCoys and start realizing that the only way that we're going to get better as a nation is if we build relationships with each other and support each other and value each other. And that means clubs, academies, governing bodies, districts, leagues, referees. I love referees, Nikki. Where's Nikki? <laughs> She's already left. Eh? Um, everyone has a role to play in making Canada soccer successful. I think that reigns true, and I think a lot of people would sort of feel that here tonight. Ian, you're sort of at the forefront of that. Does some of what Jason just said here ring true to you? Yeah, it absolutely does. And um, if my mic okay? Okay. The, um, uh, and, and actually, I, I brought a quote that I wanted to, uh, to say to everybody. Um, it's actually from uh, someone by the name of uh, Adina Menzel. Anybody know that name? Um, she, she sang the song from Frozen. I believe uh, John Travolta referred to her as Adele Del Z. Um, but um, uh, the, the, really what it says is, let it go, let it go. You can't hold back anymore. Let it go, let it go. And um, I think all of us have heard that for, uh, sung by your eight-year-olds in the back of our cars far too much. But I, I think it, it rings true. Um, we, uh, everybody in this room, is a piece of the puzzle. And um, I, I, uh, I grew up in Brantford, Ontario. Anybody from Brantford here? Maybe. Um, my, uh, my dad actually started soccer in Brantford in 1968. Um, but uh, when we moved to Canada, um, I actually grew up with Wayne Gretzky. And uh, he and I played uh, hockey together when I was 11. He did OK. Um, <laughs> and, um, um, and I always remember when grade nine came along, uh, we all expected that Wayne was going to show up at our high school. He went to a different elementary school. He was going to show up at our high school. And uh, he never did. And everybody's like, what happened? I thought this kid, Wayne Gretzky, was going to be, I've never met him before. You know, where is he? And that was the year that he moved to Toronto to, um, to uh, live with his uncle and play with the uh, Toronto Young Nationals at the age of 14. And, um, uh, and at the time, it was like, oh, man, he was going to be on the high school hockey team, and we were going to be great. And, and, but he was gone. And um, his parents realized very, very early that he needed to move on to somewhere else. And I think it's a, it kind of a, it was always a lesson for me, and I think maybe a lesson for the people in this room, that we are just a small part of the growth of a player. Uh, we will never take a player from the age of five to the age of 23 and help them sign their pro contract. Um, we, are, we are one of the, the, the pieces to, to, uh, to get them there. And we have that here in London, you know, Jade Kovacevic, who's probably one of the best um, uh, collegiate uh, uh, female players ever to be seen in Canada. She's playing in Italy right now. She won't be playing for our team this year. And uh, she's playing in Italy, uh, professional for Roma. And Carl Hayworth, who played with us for a number of years when we won the PDL championship in 2012. And um, he, at one point, went to the coach it was, uh, and, and said, hey, I, I got to miss five games. I'm playing for the national team. And our response was, that's fantastic. Go, go, go to the next level. And he now plays for the Ottawa Fury. And um, so we're, we're very proud of the role that we play in that. And I think all of us need to recognize the role that, that, that you play in taking a player, uh, recognizing what they've got, and helping them go to the next level, which probably doesn't involve you. And um, I think if we keep that in mind, then we can all play our part in achieving some of the goals that you're talking about. And connecting those dots is so important for not just on the micro level, but on the, the larger perspective as well. And uh, no bigger vision right now in Canada is the Canadian Premier League. 
Uh, Roy Nezrael has had a big part in helping that sort of come to fruition. And for people like myself who have been writing and talking about this since 2010, the fact that it's almost here still is giving me chills. And we're, we're, we're two months away from this happening. And it's, it's amazing that this has occurred. And for us, you're, you're a big picture person, Roy. Uh, you've played a major part in defining the look and the feel of CPL as we know it. And when you sat down to map out what you wanted the Canadian Premier League to be known as, what were some of those themes that you wanted to connect from the grassroots right up to the Prem, right down to the, the local operators? The, what were those things that you were looking for? I, first, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. First, uh, uh, I want to uh, express how much I'm grateful first to be in Canada. For many people in the room who don't, who don't know me, I'm just 18 months in this beautiful country. Uh, me and my family, we choose Canada as a new home. Uh, I'm an immigrant, I come from a Lebanese background, and it's been a phenomenal journey so far. The love and support of the people around us has been amazing. As well, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, Scott, David, and Paul for giving me uh, uh, the power to be part of this legacy, part of this league. Uh, uh, we don't launch a league every day, uh, and we should be all proud uh, or what's coming down the road for this league. And as well tonight, Johnny and the team, it's a privilege to be here, best in class, people, beautiful minds around us. Uh, so to, to go back to the question, uh, 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 the first the first day uh, first day in the job, uh, everybody in the office came to me and we said, okay, here you go, we want to launch the league, how we want to launch the league. And uh, after several conversations and spoke with bit some people in the office, went down to some research. And I think after a long weekend, I came back to the office and I said, the best way to launch the league is basically to listen to the people. It's finding this insight and build something meaningful and find the story that we can all build this league around. So what I did, I packed for 30 days and I hit the road city by city, almost 12 cities, spent two days in each city, and I made a fun hashtag of it, it's called Roy on the Road on Twitter, and I went from city to another city, and I almost met everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I met the tourism team, I met moms, dads, families, the associations, supporters, of course, uh, uh, mayors, I, uh, I, I explored Edmonton from a helicopter. Uh, it's been, I think, the best experience of my life. And during the 30 days, the amount of information I learned, uh, as well being new to Canada, being able to explore in your first four or five months, the cost to cost experience has been, has been it's a privilege. So uh, the amount of information that came, the amount of insights that we learned, on the ground from everybody has been phenomenal. All these insights uh, came down to one big theme, which is for Canadians and <coughs> Canadians. Uh, and from a city perspective, every single information we got, every, every story we heard has been the driver behind the inspiration of every day we have, uh, we've, uh, every day we, our day to day, uh, 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 vision from a marketing perspective, whether building the identities of the league of, or the clubs, whether uh, inspiring the story, whether announcing the players. And, it's, and uh, uh, one of the biggest things we learn as well that our supporters, our fans, our coaches, our players, the people that work behind the scenes, uh, at, uh, at the association, the, the, the fabric of each city, they strive for excellence in this country. And that's what the league has been trying to achieve and build around it, whether the recent media deal we built. And we're gonna continue to drive this soon, the full app, which will help us to keep listening and learning uh, about, uh, uh, from our supporters. And hopefully soon, the story will continue through the launch of the kids. It's, it's an interesting juxtaposition because you have Roy, sort of the new kid on the block, and then MLS right beside him. And if for us, I mean, in a lot of ways, MLS's entry into Canada sort of kick-started the revolution of the game in this country. 
Uh, a lot of what we see right now with the renewed belief in our national teams, uh, starting our own professional league, and all that intangible growth that has come without TFC and MLS planting their flag in 2007, I don't know if we would be seeing the movement that is afoot here in this country as it is right now. And now Diego, that passion has always been there and it really sparked that flame, but without all that change going on, what do you see the role for MLS in Canada and what is it for now and what is it in the future? Um, <clears throat> I would say it's, it's funny because I coming to, to London and on the plane I was thinking, oh, Okay, what, what, what is the real vision uh, in Canada? Because we tend to be, and I, and I come from a marketing background, so I spent eight years at Procter & Gamble on marketing and another eight years at Coca-Cola in marketing. And there's one thing that you always learn when you're doing marketing in Canada, which is if it works in the US, it doesn't work in Canada. That's basically how it works. <laughs> and if it works in English Canada, it's not gonna work in Quebec. So, <laughs> You, what is the ownable space? And I think everybody in this room, if, if we really take a step back, and you kind of touched on it, Jay, which is, what is our ultimate goal? And I lived through it in, in my home country. I came 11 years ago, haven't done the coast to coast yet, but uh, I'll do it soon enough. Um, it's turning hockey country into soccer country. And Everybody in this room should have that as part of their goal. Whatever you do on a daily basis, how do you move just an inch closer to that goal? And if you want to think about the bigger vision, which is in, in my mind, and this might be uh, too much of a big dream, but by 2030, Canada is a real contender in the 100th anniversary of the World Cup in Argentina, Uruguay, 2030. Now, if we wanted that to happen, then by 26, nothing less than advancing from the group stage. And if that, we want to make that happen, then in 22, we, nothing less than qualifying well into the World Cup. So honestly, it, everything we've got to do starts tomorrow. If the players of 2030 are, what, 10 years old, 11 years old today? They're here. Like, they're in your organizations. They're, we're, we're Bill. Like, what are we doing today to get to that 2030 goal? And then, from the league side, not dissimilar to what the MLS team in the US does, which is grow the fandom, grow the commercial uh, business for the league, and then ultimately provide the ability for players to develop or fans to develop. When the ratings are great on TV, then the sponsors jump, and then the sponsors jump, they want to get to grassroots because that's how they can recruit youngsters into their brands, and then that's more business for uh, regional associations, for the provincial associations. So it's just, and it's not fast. But if we all are rowing towards the same goal, that same vision, then everybody knows what they need to do tomorrow. That's how I see it. Well, let's get into that a little bit, because I think what you're, you're, you're saying is, is, is pretty spot on, and it ties in well to, to the gentleman next to you, Bill Manning at Toronto FC. There's, there was an interesting development recently with Toronto FC and the MLS Pro Clubs here in Canada as it relates to Canada soccer. Now, there was a formalizing of the Men's Excel program within these environments, creating linkages, including the tracking, periodization of the competition programs, and alignment of those calendars. Now, that's, a, that's something that we haven't done up until this point, and that alignment is so important in funneling players up into our national teams. So that's, that's some groundbreaking stuff. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, Bill. Why was that so important from Toronto FC's perspective to open up those doors and work together, and ultimately, to what, what positive outcomes do you see coming out of this? Yeah, look, I, I'm a big believer in building bridges and, and, and collaboration, I think. Um, um, that's that's how you know it, it's a rising tide lifts all boats and, and I and I do think um, what is good for Toronto FC is good for Canada soccer and I do think what's good for Canada soccer is good for Toronto FC and you know we, we were fortunate and, and it was an honor for us uh, that John Herdman and his staff spent a week at our training ground and really getting to know our coaches and, and our philosophy. And, and for me, it was so important for our coaches to understand the national team's philosophy and what they're looking for in young players. Um, you know, we have an academy program of roughly uh, 100 and 130 kids are, are part of our academy program. And there's three Americans, my son, <laughs> Greg Vanny's two kids, and everyone else is Canadian. And so it is very much in our best interest 
to develop these kids. And we take great pride when they go to the national team programs. We just had seven of our players got named to the U17 national team program. Um, and, and a lot was from John and his staff being, being with us. Um, when you talk about schedules and, and pulling things together, I'll give a couple of examples how it was not working. Um, we brought a, a group over to the Via Reggio tournament in Italy, which is one of the most prestigious tournaments in the world. And the Canadian uh, under 20 national team set a camp at the same time. And so obviously we weren't talking to each other and, and, and we had to really work through that this was an important tournament for us, that we felt it was better for them to be in Italy playing against Juventus, who actually tied 1-1. Um, than, than being at the national team camp. And then a few months later, we went to the Dallas Cup and we had a similar challenge where there was a, a national team program for the U-17s, yet we were bringing our age group to the Dallas Cup, which is one of the top tournaments in the world. And so that will never happen again now. Now that we, we are, we're coordinating schedules and we're working together, um, and, and it's, it's, it's actually been a pleasure that, that we see each other not as competitors, but, but we're actually working together to hopefully one day see this national team um, do great on the world stage. And so this whole Excel program and, and getting the MLS teams involved and then eventually the CPL teams involved um, is really important. Um, it's important that we talk to each other. And that's, you know, Jason said, you know, we're, we're put down the weapons and then we yeah. work together. And I can tell you, it was not always that way um, at Toronto FC. There was a uh, a very insular kind of mode where, where we didn't need to work with the national teams, and, and I believe completely the opposite. Um, we take great pride now that, that when our players go to the national teams. So Jason, jump in there as well and give us sort of the Canada soccer perspective on where those linkages exist now and where else do we need to put them so that we are creating, as Bill said, collaborative efforts towards uh, our, our own, own goals. Yeah, I mean, group. I, I think that's a really great word collaboration. I also think it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, as Bill intimated, what's good for TFC, Vancouver Whitecaps, Montreal Impact, and MLS, what's good for the CPL clubs is also good for Canada soccer and, soccer and vice versa. But I would take that symbiotic relationship and extend it down. So what's good for Ontario soccer is good for Canada soccer. What's good for Ontario soccer is good for the regions, the districts, the clubs, the academies, the leagues. We have to stop working against each other and start working with each other for one common purpose, which is to create an opportunity for kids in this country to fulfill their dreams in the game. Because when, when I go around the country, I ask the same question. Why do you do this? Why are you sitting here on a Friday night when you could be home with your family? I guarantee you the overwhelming majority of you would put your hand up when I said, do you do it for the kids? Everyone says that, I do it for the kids. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it and actually put your differences with other adults aside and work with people and build relationships and maybe consider someone else's perspective. You know, we're, we've, we've, we've become world class at being self-proclaimed experts and everyone has all the answers. And, and I, I go back to one of the quotes of one of my mentors is if you, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need to surround yourself with smart people that you can learn from and work with and share with and be a little bit vulnerable. You know, we, we, we all want to protect what's ours. These are mine, Ian. You can't take them. They're mine, <laughs> right? We all want to have ours. You hear it all the time. They're going to steal my players. They're not your players. Unless they've signed a pro contract, you don't own them. You provide a service for them. And if they choose to participate in the soccer program that you offer, it's because they want to be there. You shouldn't have rules put in place that restrict the option that kids have. They should be able to choose the best program for, for, for them and their circumstances. So Ian, just uh, elaborate on that a little bit further. Uh, what can the pro entities do, whether it be TFC, MLS, CPL, to better support clubs like yours, uh, either in helping you develop players or creating sustainability for clubs so that you are able to sort of let those players go on? Yeah, I, I, I think um, it's interesting. We, we all, uh, we're all very competitive. I'd hazard a guess if we all took a psych test, we're all, all at least type A's, if not triple type A's in this room. Um, and, um, and, and because of that, I think it's interesting that when um, you know, we, you know, we go home and we ask Alexa what's uh, 1.7 times 1.34 and you get an answer about that fast. 
And you uh, go to a website, you click on a link, and you get an answer about that fast. And then I hear Jason DeVos here start talking about 2024 and 2028 and 2030. And my first knee-jerk reaction is, what are you to No, we need to fix it now. We need to fix it today. We need to fix it with the kids I have this year. And then you really have to take a deep breath and step back and go, that's totally wrong. You're not going to fix it today. Uh, what we're doing today is, is a step in the right direction. Um, uh, it's nothing more than a rung on a ladder toward a goal. And, and that's the role we all play. And I think um, uh, one of the things that, um, that TFC does for us, um, we have a, an academy here in London, London TFC Academy, and uh, it's aspirational. You know, we wear the colors, we're Adidas, we have their logo on our shirts, and, and the kids uh, run around wearing toots with, with uh, London, um, uh, London TFC on them. It's aspirational. And I think um, uh, certainly one of the things that, um, that, that the MLS clubs have done is they've given a vision and they've given a goal. Um, you know, we now see kids um, at uh, the BMO Center, which is a you know, great facility we have here in London. Um, and. Um, when we have little mini tournaments, it's, oh, I want to be Man U and, and uh, I want to be Arsenal. But no, they, oh, we want to be Atlanta. Oh, we want to be Toronto FC. We want to be Vancouver. We want to be Montreal. And I think that that's something that probably 10 years ago d d that you wouldn't have seen. So I think certainly the, the one thing that the clubs have done is, uh, is um, they, they've gone to set a goal. And I think uh, the more that they engage with the communities and um, uh, give opportunities uh, for, uh, for trials and uh, the, the ability to have visibility in the community makes a big, big difference. And if they continue to do that, I think we're moving in the right direction. And we will get there, not in six months, but we will get there by <laughs> 2030. It's, it's an, an interesting uh, point because, I mean, it does have to start today, but it also is going to take time and we have to be mindful of that. Uh, one of the things Toronto FC did very recently from that context in supporting those clubs was creating that youth scholarship program night. Um, it's a fantastic initiative in which TFC provides compensation and recognition to the Ontario clubs and academies who have graduated their players into the TFC ranks. Now solidarity payments are of course the norm in the rest of the world, but this is the first we've really seen something like this in Canada. So Bill, what prompted you to take that step and connect with clubs in this way so that they feel like they've gotten something back for graduating that player on? No, it was very important to acknowledge that, you know, the soccer existence of a player doesn't start with TFC. It actually starts at the, at the youth level, at the grassroots level. Um, I had a chance, uh, I told Jason this, uh, the other day there was a, a youth soccer coach who couldn't make our scholarship night, and he came to the training ground, and I asked him to come. Uh, there was a guy named Laza Lowe, and he, he emigrated here from Jamaica in 1975. And at least eight, eight just like a name off the top, you know, Noble Lakello, Ashton Morgan, Richie Luria, um, Jordan Hamilton, they all came up to him as if he was a god. And this, honestly, this is in our training ground with our professional players. Um, he had coached those kids when they were seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, and then they went on to, to other clubs, some to the TFC Academy. Um, and he was talking to me about how Canada was in 1975 when he had to get you know, people to put down hockey sticks. Um, but that was an example of someone that we wanted to just acknowledge. Um, he had a kid recently that, that, that joined our program at, at U16, and we give a, a scholarship out. And so last year we gave out about $75,000 to the, to the youth soccer community, and some clubs got, got um, a larger amount, some clubs got one amount. Um, but really it was based off, we had 27 new kids join our academy this past year. Um, and we want to recognize the clubs that were part of that journey. Um, and it's much different than solidarity, because solidarity is when they sign a professional contract. Um, and all we've asked of the clubs that have, uh, that have received this is we actually asked to take the money towards a scholarship for deserving young players, maybe, or, 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 or even teenagers, that maybe families can't afford um, our sport, because our, our sport has become expensive. Um, uh, unfortunately, and so that is something we, we, we're we trying to put money back into the community um, so that we can have more opportunities for young, um, aspiring, aspirational players. And so the scholarship program for us has, uh, I think, built a lot of bridges because 
we're now getting, you know, kind of as Jason said, one of the responses I got when I first came in and I met a lot of people um, in the youth soccer community was they're taking my players. And it's, it's, it's difficult for me to digest because, um, you know, our academy um, it, it is a pathway to our first team and then some of the kids even, uh, you know, beyond. And it is something where I don't view it as we're taking someone's players. We're just the next step in the ladder. And, and what I did want to do, though, was recognize that you're helping. And, and hopefully these funds can go towards making your club a better club or a bigger club or give some kid the opportunity to play. So um, I thought it was very important that we did put cash back into the system um, as, as, as part of that. And it's been well received. And I think the... I, I, I say this now, we receive more incoming calls now from coaching directors and from clubs. Uh, it's a hundredfold from what we received three years ago. Um, and I think now part of what I'm trying to bridge is we're, we're not the enemy. We're, we, we want people to root for us. And, and now putting money back into the system I think is important because we do generate money through sponsorships and ticket sales and so on. So. Um, again, it's, it's that collaboration and, 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 and being the next step along the journey, not the journey doesn't start with us, so it's recognition. So we're talking a lot about like playing in the sandbox well together. Uh, when I was researching for this panel, uh, I was trying to find examples of where other countries where there was a national league and then another league entirely uh, from another country, and there wasn't a lot of examples. There was a, a few in South America. So Diego, I'm wondering if you can sort of give us your perspective on this. Uh, how do you see this unique, unique dynamic between MLS and CPL and where the two can work together and where the competitive lines are gonna exist? I think uh, everybody has touched it in a different way, but we basically all said the same thing. It, whatever is great for CPL is going to be great for Major League Soccer, is going to be great for Canadian soccer. And, and when you think about it, and when you think about the GTA, GVA, GMA, the core, core, core supporters of the club, that's about 30 to 35% of the soccer supporters in Canada. It's got a lot of room. Uh, so. Uh, the CPO coming into communities that do not have a professional team today and will have the ability to enjoy this, the, the beautiful game, that's going to grow fandom for Canada soccer, it's going to grow fandom for their local clubs, it's going to grow fandom for TFC, and it's going to grow fandom for the league. So on the personal side is how do we also bring the bigger narrative of Major League Soccer in North America, like all of the other leagues in North America do, and then tell the story that it's not just Canada and it's not just the U.S. and that, that there's, there's interesting things happening in soccer in North America. Uh, we are the number one league in North America. We want to be one of the top leagues in the world. Now, it's going to take baby steps to get there, but it starts with, uh, with just making the game accessible to everybody and then enjoyable for, for everyone. So I just see it as a positive, to be honest. Canada's in this unique position in the world in that we're the most, uh, our most popular national team is the women's national team. Uh, they routinely do bigger numbers uh, on television and in stadium attendances for home matches. Uh, they're consistently the larger of the two and the more successful of the two. And I couldn't think of another country in the world where that exists. So my, my question is to you, Roy, from a marketing perspective, what opportunity does this reality present to the CPL when it comes to the women's game as well in Canada? You know, you're absolutely right. I think the, the women number are amazing. I mean, it's been a successful story we should all celebrate and keep celebrating. And, you know, why not documenting it and making it a Netflix show as well? Uh, I, I remember my first week I had the luxury to fly to, uh, to BC, uh, to Vancouver, uh, and my first game, game day experience for me in Canada was watching uh, the women national team, Canada playing the US. Uh, and while walking to the game, and uh, uh, I realized something I have, haven't seen it in my whole life. Men wearing a Sinclair jersey. I mean, if John is here, I told him the story. Like, you don't see this around the world. That's unique to Canada. That's, that's something we should be all be proud and build on uh, on the men's side. Uh, uh, but I think fr from a men's perspective, I think with the new Nation League, uh, uh, system, you will see the men playing more competitive games, and it will help not only the TV, but as well the social media, 
the engagement around the team from a media perspective as well to grow the number. Let, let, uh, the way I look at Canada, I think when I came, I had this idea of Canada is hockey or football or basketball, should I connect with NBA, should I, should I look in what other sports? But the moment I hit the road and I went, spent these 30 days uh, on the ground, uh, I realized that we're a, we're a soccer nation. Uh, if you guys uh, look at the numbers, the number one sports participation for youth is soccer. And this is all the great work you guys are doing, really. This is phenomenal. It's uh, 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 the, num the numbers that uh, not only from a youth participation, but as well, uh, this is the only sport that male and female are 50-50. Other sports are either male dominant or a female dominant. So if, if, you look at, if, if you look at it from a, from a men's perspective, of course the numbers will change and will improve. I think with the new system, with the vision that John, Coach John and, and all the coaches are, are leading on. From a CPL perspective, I think the next 60 days is crucial. We want to make sure this is, uh, uh, we lead to a, to a successful launch, but more importantly, we want pro soccer to succeed in Canada. So David uh, always remind us in the office, uh, focus uh, is a key aspect for us at the moment. So we're putting our heads down. We want to focus to build the men professional league. And once it's the right time, we'll speak about the women professional league as well in Canada. So we only have a few more minutes left for the panel discussion here tonight. And I ask everybody to stay in your seats because we're going to honor some clubs, uh, deserving clubs, after the panel discussion as well. Uh, but before we get out of here on to other things, I do want to touch on one other thing because this, I feel in addition to the CPL and what Toronto FC has done and the local clubs are doing, one of the biggest things that's going to come down in the next year or so is the Canada Soccer Club Licensing Program. And Jason's here this weekend to talk a little bit about that. And I don't want to preempt that talk because I know that's something you're going to put a ton of time and energy into, but let's look at that long term, Jason. Ten years down the line, the program's been fully rolled out, it's been implemented. What positive changes do you see, do you envision having taken place from the club licensing program? Uh, every club and academy working together in one system that everyone has equal access to, and everyone's providing a safe, enjoyable, accessible and inclusive, developmentally appropriate environment for players and coaches, so that players, coaches, Volunteers, referees, everyone can reach their goals and fulfill their dreams. Um, you'll, hear, you'll hear this message tomorrow from John. Uh, if you weren't planning on being here for his, his keynote talk, you should be. Because he is going to push buttons and he's going to challenge you to get behind the jersey and be part of building a new Canadian soccer landscape. And, and these gentlemen here have a massive role to play in that, the professional game. And you might be feeling that that's a million miles away from where you are at the grassroots club level. It isn't. Because every single one of the players that pulls on a professional team jersey, every single one of the players that pulls on a national team jersey, male and female, start in your clubs and academies. That's where they get their start. That's where they fall in love with the game. So the club licensing is going to make you better, help you become better. It's going to support you to be better. It's not about being punitive. It's not about being discriminatory. It's the complete opposite. It's a help mechanism. It's a support line to help your organization become the best version of itself. And that doesn't mean that every organization has to be uh, an organization that has thousands of players and a multi-million dollar budget. The volunteer-driven, volunteer-based organizations are crucial in this, in this country. I started at Glencoe Minor Soccer. Anybody in Glencoe? Anybody? Few, few people in the room from, from the London area. Um, completely volunteer-driven organization. You pay $25, you got a Kelly Green jersey, you had to hang the nets with tape at the local elementary school. That's where we played. But that's where I got my start. And if it wasn't for those volunteers, I never would have reached this level. Never would have had a chance to play professional football. Never would have had a chance to fulfill my dream of playing for my country in a World Cup. I got halfway there. I got to play for my country, but I never got to a World Cup. And all of the initiatives that are going on right now, club licensing, changes in coach education, new staff coming on board that I'm really excited about. I've never been more excited about the future of Canadian soccer based on what we have in place right now. So the perfect time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. They say that. The next best time is today. And that's what the club licensing program is going to be about. We're planting a tree that we're going to sit under the shade of in 20 years. But if we don't plant it and nurture it now, it's never going to grow. 
And that's what we have to do together is build relationships, repair broken relationships, be the, be the bigger person and put your weapons down. And if you have a, a, a Hatfield and a McCoy situation, reach out to them and say, hey, can we work together? Because I care about my kids and I know you care about your kids. And if they're the most important thing to all of us, then we as adults need to set a good example for them and work together. Because if we don't do that, we're dooming them to you know, repeat the mistakes that we've made over the years. Well, yeah, I, th I think, you know, to your point, um, the, the tree analogy is an interesting one. And, you know, one would think that the tree sits on my property or it sits on your property. And the reality of it is that the tree's somewhere out there. The and roots for, go and, deep. And for a couple of years, you go up and water it and work on it. And a couple of years, I go up and went. And if we all kind of put that into it, um, eventually that tree's going to grow into something. And every one of us can say we had something to do with that. So working together, breaking down walls, sounds like good themes we can carry into this weekend, Ontario Soccer Summit. Please thank this panel before us here tonight.